Do you have a child who's just a little bit inflexible or maybe very inflexible? Do they have meltdowns at times that surprise you? Like in the midst of a birthday party or whenever there's a slight change in routine or just when they get overly tired? If so, you know both the embarrassment and the fear for your child that goes along with it. What on earth is going on? As the holidays approach, along with the fun, comes a whole other set of stressors that may cause already inflexible children and their families to miss the magic that this time of year brings. Today, we're going to talk about the behavior under the behavior that you see. We'll look at how retained reflexes impact behavior and learning and how to bring sanity and ease back into your and your child's world. This is LD Expert Live. You may have experienced how a big snowstorm near one airport can cause flight delays and cancellations all over the country. When you get to your <clears throat> you you get to your destination eventually, but this causes a great deal of anxiety and disruption to people's lives, especially during the holidays. Just as air travel is dependent on an organized system of flight patterns, our nervous system is organized around a system of reflexes. Primitive reflexes support survival and development in infants to be replaced with higher level reflexes as the brain and muscles mature. Reflexes need to be working properly in order for us to move through life with ease and flow. When reflexes are not integrated or working properly, they're kind of like canceled flights and closed airports, causing disruption, disorganization, and distress to, per to the person's functioning, attention, learning, and family. Retained or unintegrated reflexes are often at the root of behavior that causes parents to worry and wonder, why does my child act this way? Welcome to LD Expert Live, your place for answers and solutions for learning differences, dyslexia, and attention challenges. I'm your host, Jill Stowell, founder of Stowell Learning Centers and author of At Wit's End, A Parent's Guide to Ending the Struggle, Tears, and Turmoil of Learning Disabilities. This book will help you understand your bright but struggling student better, and there are chapters in it devoted to the topic we're talking about today. To get a free copy, go to parentsatwitsend.com. Lauren Ma and Brianna Hurst from our Stowa Learning Center team will be joining me today for this discussion. Good morning, Brianna and Lauren. Hi. There you are. Hello. Thanks for having me again. <laughs> it's great to have I'm you again. <laughs> Thanks. I'm excited to listen to everything that y'all have to talk about this morning. This is a great topic, chock full of information, I'm sure. Um, I want to say hello to everyone. Hopefully I can live up to uh, Maddie here. Let's see if I can do some multitasking. Uh, we have Mona who's tuning in. Good morning, Mona. From Futures in Pasadena. We know her. Oh, okay. Yeah. Hi, Mona. Mm -hmm. And then Karen. And hi, Karen. So fun fact, this topic today was actually requested by Karen, one of our faithful viewers. Thank you, Karen. Um, I, it's a topic that parents often ask us about. So I really encourage you to start posting your comments. Um, if you're just tuning in, say hi. Um, and uh, just we encourage you to check in, post comments, questions. We can't wait to hear from you guys. Yeah, let us know where you're viewing from. We love every week to see all the different places that people are checking in from. So be sure to say hi in the comments and let us know where, where you're uh, watching from. Um, don't forget about our mom squad. So um, we have our private Facebook group, Mom Squad, which is a resource for parents of children and teens with learning challenges. Um, it's, it's a community. We're there to support each other, especially now parents need support more than ever. 
Um, and I'm excited to announce that coming in January 2021, we'll be resuming our peace meetings, um, running run them through Mom Squad on Facebook. Uh, our peace meetings are it's parent enrichment and continued education. We used to hold them in person um, in all four of our centers, but now that we've gone virtual, we're doing a virtual meeting via Zoom. So you can participate and comment and ask questions live in real time. And then we will also stream it through Mom Squad, our private Facebook group. So I'm really looking forward to that. Peace was a, a huge resource. It was a great way to build community and just to like connect with other parents that get it. So um, I'll be hosting those starting in January. Great. Thank you, Lauren and Brianna. Brianna, we'll check back in with you and our viewers in just a bit. Right. This is LD Expert Live. I'm your host, Jill Stowell. Today, Lauren and I will be talking about how retained reflexes impact behavior and learning. Did you know that bedwetting beyond the age of five and sleep problems may be related to a retained spinal gallant reflex. A child who hates to wear shoes may have a retained Babinski reflex. An aggressive, defiant child prone to temper tantrums or a child who gives up easily and is overly dependent may have a fear paralysis reflex. A student with memory and reading problems may have a retained STNR, symmetrical tonic neck reflex. A student who speaks well but can't get their thoughts on paper may have a retained ATNR reflex. At the most basic level, much of the communication between the brain and the body via our nervous system happens as a result of reflexes. Reflexes that are active when they're not needed or not active when they are needed create glitches in that communication. Unintegrated reflexes or reflexes that aren't working properly cause stress to our whole system and push us into fight or flight mode. Spending too much time in fight or flight when we don't actually need to be fighting or running for survival can lead to rigid, anxious behavior and fear of change. Lauren is going to give you a little primer on primitive reflexes. She has the unique perspective of professionally being an expert in this area, but also has the mom perspective with her two beautiful little girls. Right. So um, a lot of parents, you know, when they come to us and they're kind of investigating their child's learning challenges, we, we talk to them and we, we test kids for primitive reflexes. So they ask us, what are primitive reflexes? So primitive reflexes are neurological patterns. They're actually housed in the spinal cord. They don't go through the brain um, because they're, the purpose of a reflex is to protect us. We want a faster reaction time. Um, and so they're there for survival, to protect us, to strengthen our muscles as we grow and develop. It's not intentional movement. And so to help illustrate the, this idea of reflexes better, I'm gonna talk about how reflexes impact my two girls. So here they are, um, here they are, <laughs> there they are, yeah. So um, here are my two girls. On the left there is Cambria. She just turned five, we call her Cammy. And on the right there is Avalon. She is my new baby that I just have had and she is three and a half months and we call her Abby for short. So um, I'm gonna be talking about them as I kind of talk about reflexes throughout this because I think it helps for parents to just like experience it like it, it's real. It makes it real and not kind of just theory. So reflexes start to develop in utero and they should be present in the first two years of life. So the, here's where I'm gonna talk about Abby. This is where Abby is right now. She's three and a half months. She should be showing reflexes. Those should, should be present in her. I call her my little ball of reflexes because that's all she's doing. It's not intentional movement. She's, she's just responding to stimulation in her environment. My husband, who does not know anything about reflexes, um, with both of his girls thinks they're they're both geniuses and so she'll um you know make a, a movement she'll grab his his hand and grip really tight and he oh 
she's so strong, you know, oh, oh, she must be, she's going to be really strong when she grows up. No, dear, that's a reflex. Or he'll go to kiss her on her cheek and she'll like open her mouth and, oh, she's a genius. She knew I was going to kiss her. No, dear, that's a reflex. <laughs> and so, and so she's not intentionally, you know, thinking about her movements. She's just responding to the stimulation. Um, as Abby grows up and and keeps making those reflexive movements, those reflexes will start to integrate or go away. This is what is supposed to happen as higher level, more intentional movements take over. But in the case with many of our students at the Learning Center and with my own daughter, Cami, sometimes they don't and it can cause disruption to learning or behavior. And so a lot of parents, when, they, when we start talking about reflexes and retained reflexes, they ask, well, what causes reflexes to be retained or to not integrate when they should? Um, and we get this question a lot. So we, um, we tell parents there are certain risk factors that can contribute to retained reflexes. Um, first one is genetics. So um, a family history of ADHD or autism, um, other learning challenges could be a contributing factor um, to, to having retained reflexes in, in an individual. Number two is stress during pregnancy or birth. Um, so, you know, threatened miscarriage, um, induced labor, prolonged labor, C-section deliveries also put a, a baby at risk for having retained reflexes because reflexes, some of the purpose of those reflexes is to help the baby during the birthing process and that movement kind of down the birth canal helps to integrate those reflexes. And when you have a C-section baby, they didn't get that experience. So a lot of times um, we see that as being um, a risk factor for retained reflexes. The third is environmental factors that could happen within the first two years of life. Because again, those reflexes are there to protect us and they integrate through movement. So if a child um, maybe had restricted movement in the first few years of life. We see this with NICU babies that were in incubators or um, when I was the director of the Irvine Center, about 20% of our population um, of students were actually adopted. And, and um, it's the case with students that were, or children that were adopted maybe in foreign countries where there were still orphanages and they didn't get a lot of stimulation or didn't have a lot of room to move around that can cause retained reflexes um, any extra stress during the first two years of life again because those reflexes are there to protect us can cause the reflexes to remain uh, past the time that they're no longer needed so now let's look at, at where reflexes kind of fall on our learning continuum so reflexes are housed at the very bottom of that green level for learning skills they're they're just the beginning and foundation of core learning skills. They're unintentional movement, they occur um, in the spinal core, not even in the brain yet. Um, and so they're the, the very foundation to all thinking and learning higher up in the continuum. And when we usually think of the continuum, we often talk about academics and learning at the top in the orange and the red, but behavior is also a higher level function that could go up there in the orange and the red because it's a symptom you see um, that is usually stemming from an underlying skill that's not serving the individual well. So little things are happening all the time because of reflexes and they come out as behavior. And what we're seeing more and more of in the center is that um, kids are coming to us with either diagnoses or they're being treated because of their behavior. I've seen kids as young as five on prescribed medications for anxiety or depression, um, attention, behavioral and emotional labels, things like that. And when we go and test them for retained reflexes, we find that a lot of their reflexes are retained and present. And, and really at the root then of those behaviors and, and that anxiety. Yeah. Well, that was great, Lauren. Thank you. Let's, let's take a closer look at some of the behaviors that I mentioned earlier and how unintegrated reflexes could be at the root of that behavior, attention, or learning issue. So bedwetting can be frustrating and embarrassing, but if a reflex is at the root of that problem, you can't shame or punish a kid out of bedwetting. There is a reflex called the spinal gallant. And, uh, it's activated by touching along either side of the lower spine. And, and when it's active 
and you touch that area, then the hips will sort of flex side to side. In utero, the purpose of this is so that the baby can kind of wiggle their spine up against the spine of the mother. And that's actually the beginning of auditory processing because the baby is now getting sound through bone conduction. And then in birth, being able to flex the hips kind of helps as the baby goes through the birth canal. Well, if that reflex is retained, as the child gets older, then it if it's activated, say they're sleeping on their back or they change positions while they're sleeping, well, that reflex is also connected to the bladder. So it can then cause bedwetting. It can cause sleep problems because they're wiggling all the time. Uh, it can cause kids to be very sensitive to tight clothing. So you may have a child who will only wear certain things, but other things, they're not going to wear them because they don't realize it, but it makes them uncomfortable because they're it's triggering that reflex. Um, these are kids that, you know, when they're sitting in class, you think they have ants in their pants, you know, they're just wiggling all the time. And so they get told to sit still, sit still, sit still. Well, subconsciously, they may really try to sit still. And when they do that, now their body gets very rigid. And so a lot of their attention gets funneled away trying to keep their body still. And so they miss information. And of course, that's going to impact memory and learning. Absolutely. Another reflex we see retained often in students at the Learning Center is the ATNR, the asymmetrical mm -hmm. tonic neck reflex. It's the reflex in babies that's triggered um, when the baby turns his head, the arm juts out, the same side arm and eventually so here and then eventually uh, further out. Um, it helps the baby develop strength for rolling over again the head and then this side of the body can can move um, to help the baby start to develop core strength for rolling over. It starts to develop hand-eye coordination. So head goes this way, hands here, hey, I have a hand um, is, is what it starts to develop in babies and, and eventually hand-eye coordination, awareness of their hands. So this is where Abby is right now. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Laterality, hey, I have a left side, I have a right side and awareness of the two sides of the body and, and eventually being able to cross the midline. And also near to far vision, because again, the hand is connected. And so I'm looking at it up close. And then eventually as my hands move away from me, I can I can track my hands moving from near to far vision. So this is the reflex that Abby has present and she should um, at three and a half months. She's working on this right now. She She's at that stage and I don't know, um, parents, if you remember the stage when they, they discover their hands, that's where she is right now. So I can, I'll walk in and I'll see her and she's just like fixated on her hand right now. Well, that's, that's happening because of her ATNR. Her ATNR made that possible. Um, if it keeps happening as the brain matures and if that reflex does not integrate, let's think about what that would look like. She would probably be really distracted by her hands all the time. Um, she might have difficulty going from near to far if that doesn't properly integrate. A lack of awareness on either side of her body. So, you know, if your head is always connected to that same side of hand, you're, you're not going to develop the awareness that you have another side of your body. And, and we see that a lot of times in our students um, with learning that they have difficulty distinguishing between their right and their left. They have difficulty with tracking or moving their eyes across a page crossing the midline, um, you know, kids that that don't have a dominant side, we often see that and, and with a retained um, ATNR. We lovingly call this reflex the dyslexic reflex, not that having this reflex will give you dyslexia, but nine times out of 10, when we test a student that has dyslexia, they often have this reflex retained. And it doesn't mean that without this reflex, you know, if we integrate that reflex, the child is no longer dyslexic, but with training, the lowest level symptoms of dyslexia can start to be improved. Absolutely. That ATNR is a really big one with learning challenges. Um, and it can also be, and, and you kind of alluded to this, it can be related to difficulties with, with uh, written language mm -hmm. uh, because this reflex works with each side of the body separately uh, which does help us establish an internal sense of right and left. But 
if it doesn't integrate by about six or seven months of age, the growing child may not establish a dominant hand. So they may even look ambidextrous, which seems really cool, but actually it gets in the way of being able to write from left to right all the way across a page. Um, you may have noticed that your child uh, writes and as they write, it's as though it's going, you know, kind of diagonally down the page. Um, or they may turn their page all the way to one side so when they're reading or writing so that they never have to cross the midline of their body. And those things can result from a retained ATNR. Lauren, I know you are so aware of all of this clinically because of the work that we do, but you've also been very aware of the impact of retained reflexes from the standpoint of a parent. Absolutely. I mean, that is one of the gifts of being a parent is that your children teach you. So, um, you know, and, and here's some sharing time. I'm going to talk to you as, as a parent and kind of what I've gone through with uh, my other daughter, Cammie. So I talked about stress or complications uh, during birth as a risk factor for routine reflexes. <clears throat> this is the case of Cammie. So there she is on the left there. She's five years old now. Cammie uh, went eight days past her due date, and I, I really argued with the doctors, no, I don't want to be induced, I don't want to be induced. I had known about retained reflexes. You know, I'd, I'd worked at the Learning Center for 10 years at that point, and I didn't want a C-section. I, I just really wanted her to have the most natural birth possible. Um, but, you know, it was a factor outside my control. She was eight days late when they finally did induce me. Um, I had a very prolonged labor. <clears throat> I ended up uh, TMI, but pushing for three and a half hours. And she finally, you know, did come out and that ultimately led to her having some retained reflexes. So, and she had several. So the first one that I noticed was a retained moral reflex. So fight or flight. It's one of the reflexes. The moral reflex is a reflex that is supposed to be still elicited in us when there is a real threat. Um, we are supposed to uh, be able to startle and respond and react when there is a real danger. It helps us to deal with that threat without thinking. But if it's retained or overactive, the system responds to minor stressors more intensely. And this was Cami. So um, when she was a baby, um, she had no self-regulation. She couldn't self-soothe. People would say to me, I mean, she's a tiny little thing, like at two months. And they'd be like, oh, she's so angry for being so tiny. And at first, I just thought that she was headstrong like me uh, because, you know, I'm a headstrong person. Um, but as she grew older, I saw a pattern emerge. Um, any stressor exacerbated the moral reflex and would kick her into this extreme fight or flight if she were hungry, if she were tired, and then a stressor was added on top of that. Doctor's visits, vaccinations, dentist visits. For her vaccinations, it took myself and two nurses to hold her down because she was so, she fought us so hard. It was, she was almost like feral, um, spitting and trying to bite and just clawing. And, and of course, as a mother, you don't want to see your child go through that. It was, it was awful to watch. Um, and the nurse actually said to me afterwards, they're like, oh, we usually, only have to to do that or hold kids down, you know, to that extreme, you know, if they're if they have sensory issues or on, they're on the spectrum, and so it was unusual for her um, to behave like that. Um, and so, luckily, I was able to kind of identify this pattern and what was going on with her. Um, so I could utilize some of the resources we had at the learning center, and I used them. I'm telling you because I needed to calm that stress response down in her. It was making her miserable. It was making me miserable. Um, and it really helped to reduce her overactive Moro. You know, that Moro reflex in an infant is an indicator of a healthy nervous system and it's a protective mechanism. But boy, if it doesn't integrate by about six months, it can cause the child or even adults to operate in that state of high alert or fight or flight, as you saw with Cami, mm -hmm. And that constant state of high alert can overwork the immune system and cause hypersensitivity to touch or sound or light. It can cause allergies and upper respiratory issues. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about what happened on Halloween this year. So, like many of the other parents, I mean, I this year especially 
because of COVID. You know, I wanted, I still wanted Cami to have somewhat of a typical Halloween. You know, we weren't going to do the trick, the traditional trick or treating, um, but my my city was offering a drive through trick or treat, and so, but it was on a weeknight. It was on a Thursday night. Um, it was actually the day after her birthday, and so there was already a lot of energy and 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 fun stress kind of going on in her life. Um, and so I, you know, we got all dressed up in costumes and we got in the car and, you know, we were supposed to drive to like the fire station and the police station and you pick up candy at each stop. Well, there was a lot of traffic. And so she did a lot of sitting and there was a lot of anticipation for this event. And then a lot of sitting, um, in her car seat, um, her cousin went with us and she was so excited. So she was kind of building up this energy and then a lot of sitting and she just had an epic meltdown. I mean, one of one of the worst that she's had in a long time um, because of all of that stress, even though it was supposed to be a good stress, even though it was fun, even though it was a lot of activity um, around things that she enjoyed, it was still too much for her system to handle. Mm -hmm. So I know you don't believe this, but as a parent, you might think, well, then all those things that I did didn't work. No, um, I don't believe that because I know, one, I know my child and I, our systems are dynamic. So that's the thing about reflexes. They're supposed to fire to protect us and stress causes them to fire. And so she, you know, she, her response to stress has immensely improved, you know, three years old, which is a typical time for meltdowns and tantrums was really hard for Cammie. And that's when I started to utilize some of um, the reflex integration um, techniques and sound therapy that we'll talk about a little bit later to calm her system down to help her deal with an already kind of tumultuous time, like a, a difficult time for her. Um, the system is dynamic. And so what I, you know, even though she might still have meltdowns, her recovery is so much faster. Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, and, and the other part is Cami doesn't have, I mean, she just started transitional kindergarten. She doesn't have learning issues. But I often wonder what would have happened had I not intervened when she was much younger, because school can be a stressor as well. And what if she has difficulty with school and, and doesn't like it? Could all of those things fire up again and cause some learning challenges for her? And I'm not seeing that at all. So I, I, I you know, I fully believe that that even though here and there she'll have meltdowns and things like that, I, it's it's 100 times different than than what it used to be like with her. And, and I just want to say to parents, I mean, you were able to catch it really, really early, but you know, the brain, the body, it's amazing. It is never too late, mm -hmm. never too late. We do reflex integration with teenagers and adults and what a difference. Mm -hmm. So Cami, going back to Cami, she is, she is so smart and social. She's like a little actress in the in the making. She's adorable. Mm -hmm. um, you can't necessarily tell now that she had reflect retained reflexes, but how else was she affected? So the other thing that I noticed um, when Cami was a baby was that she wasn't meeting her developmental milestones related to movement. So she sat up on time at six months, she was right on time. Her fine motor skills were fine. She could pass objects and hold on to objects, and reach for objects, that was all fine. Um, but she never rolled over. So at four months of age, I was, I was looking for it. I was doing all the tummy time. I was trying to do everything right. She never rolled over. Um, when I got to be about nine, 10 months, she wasn't making any movements towards crawling. Um, and when she got to 12 months, she wasn't pulling herself up to stand, had no ability to even start to try to walk. Um, and so, you know, I kept asking the pediatrician, you know, I was, I was on it. Um, you know, I'd ask the pediatrician, you know, she's not rolling over. She's not crawling pediatrician, you know, ah, you know, maybe your floors are too hard, you know, give it some time, give it some time. Um, other people, you know, would say, well, she's an early talker. She did talk early. So, oh, usually when they talk early, they walk late. Okay. Um, my in-laws told me that I held her too much, you know, well, maybe because you're holding her, she's, she's not walking. Um, and eventually, you know, I, I eventually kind of bugged the pediatrician and she did, you know, was not walking for a long enough period that the, the pediatrician did, did give me a referral for a physical therapy evaluation. And she did qualify for physical therapy because she was so um, delayed in her gross motor movements. 
So at 12 months, I finally got that the physical therapy referral and we started physical therapy. We did months of physical therapy and they worked on balance and they worked on, you know, the muscles in her feet and, and trying to hold herself upright. And, and they were, you know, they moved her, her little limbs and getting her to like step and things like that. And she still wasn't walking. And then I started to see it. So I saw those reflexes getting in her way. She would, they would position her to stand up. And, and try to like move her so she could start walking, her head would go up and her knees would buckle. That's a reflex, that's the TLR. I knew it, I saw it, I, I see it in our kids. And so I'm like, okay, her reflexes are preventing her from having the coordination and the balance to be able to, to walk. And so I was determined, I was like, okay, I'm over this. When she got to be about 18 months and wasn't walking yet, I was, I'm going to use one of the tools that we have at the Learning Center called QRI, Quantum Reflex Integration. Um, and it uses um, low level light stimulation. Um, and I did it on her, this this, treat, this therapy, uh, every day for four days in a row. And by the end of the fourth day, she was walking. And everybody in our lives were, were like floored because she was nowhere near that. I mean, my husband thought it was a miracle. The, the physical therapist, oh my gosh, she all of a sudden just put everything together. It's because the reflexes were, were integrated and they were able to support her. So then all of the coordination, all of the training, all of that physical therapy, all those skills that she had built, now she was able to put them to use because the reflexes weren't getting in her way anymore. Right. It was, that was such a cool thing to see. Mm -hmm. You know, integrating retained reflexes, of course, doesn't resolve all learning, attention, or behavioral challenges, but it's important to understand their role in these difficulties. If you think about our learning skills continuum, which you saw earlier, and here it is, reflexes are at the ground floor of the core learning level, that green level, really the ground floor of the entire continuum. So a student with dyslexia or other learning challenges will almost certainly need more than just reflex integration to correct the problems. But if your child is getting appropriate interventions and they're not making the changes that you expected they would make, the answer is probably lower on the continuum because lower brain functions support the higher level functions. This is LD Expert Live. I'm Jill Stowell, founder of Stowell Learning Centers, talking with Lauren Ma about retained primitive reflexes and their connection to behavior and learning. Let's check in with Brianna and our viewers. I have a feeling this is resonating with many of you. Yes, definitely. So much info already, great info. And I love Lauren's uh, real life examples. I think a lot of parents can relate to that. So we do have a lot of people checking in. So let's say hello first. Let's see here. We have Aslam. I'm sorry if I did not say your name right. Hello, thanks for joining. Here we have Douglas. He says such important work. Yeah, I know him. Hi, Douglas. <laughs> <laughs> That's my uncle Douglas. Oh, hi, Uncle Doug. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know this lady. I think we all do. What? Miss Leah from yeah. Oklahoma. She has three children with retained reflexes. Former Beautiful. clinician. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's see here. Annie. Hi, Annie. She says she's from Pasadena. Thanks for joining us. Colleen. Hi, Colleen from Camarillo. I know Thank Colleen. You. Yeah. You know everyone. Yeah, I do. Well, from our peace <laughs> meetings, I used to do when we did peace in person, Colleen oh, would nice. come. Yeah. Ronke. Hi, Ronke. Another viewer, longtime viewer. Hi, Ronke. Okay, so now let's get into some questions. Ronke does have a question. She asks, how long do these unintegrated reflexes remain in the child? Oops. Well, generally, most of the primitive reflexes will integrate within the first year. The STNR, the um, symmetrical tonic neck reflex, that may integrate as late as three years old, but generally those reflexes are starting to integrate at two to four months. All right. And then Karen, Karen has a question. So sorry, this is a big one, but 
Um, she talks about the dreaded morrow. And I think a lot of parents, especially with what's happening right now, are dealing mm -hmm. with these issues. But she's saying it always creeps back in. Can you tell us more ways that it might show up uh, so we can recognize and then maybe do some exercises in the moment? Or is that a bad idea? Um, I mean, I, I shared a lot about Cami and kind of the characteristics that she exhibited. Any kind of atypical response to stress um, is a trigger. And then sometimes fear um, of things that, you know, kids shouldn't be fearful of because they're, they, they've patterned kind of this atypical response to stress, that they could create a pattern of being very fearful. So there was a period of time when Cami hated going into public restrooms with automatic toilets. And she had a little tiny thing. And she would ask me, is it automatic? Like that, like little tiny, like two years old. And it was because she was so fearful of that noise triggering without her control and it would throw her into morrow. Um, and so kind of things like that you wanna look for. Um, I will tell you, you know, trying to parent a kid who is in a full, full morrow response is hard, especially if you're in public, you always feel like you're being judged. Um, any kind of deep pressure, like squeezing or holding because it makes the child feel secure and safe. Um, the moral points are, um, when we talk about reflex integration, I don't know, let me see, here we go, um, are the inside of the elbows. And so a lot of times with Cami, I, that's where I would squeeze, squeal, squeeze and put pressure on her elbows, on the inside of her elbows, and just to help her and then start breathing so that she could start to um, get out of that moral state. So that that's something, a technique that I've used that really worked well for her. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, for older kids who, if they start to recognize, you know, that they're feeling really anxious, you know, crossing their arms and giving themselves some pressure there where Lauren was saying, right above the elbows, if you and, and you can kind of think about it like fight. Okay, that's so so pressure there above the elbows. That's kind of the fight response that you can settle. And then and, and then the, also right around the knees. So just above the knees, um, you know, so if they put their hands under their legs and just kind of squeeze there, or of course you can do that for younger children. But, but um, you know, this is a, a very um, stressful time. Just the whole deal with COVID and online school it's added a whole other layer of stress to everybody. And so, you know, if you see that your uh, child is more irritable, they're having more trouble paying attention, they're, you know, startling easily, um, their eyes are really dilated, like, because that's a, that's a survival response. It's like, um, my eyes have to take in absolutely everything I possibly can to see if I'm safe, you know, or they start getting hypersensitive. Um, what you want to do, I mean, just in general, especially during this time, is make sure you have routines and structure in place. Um, use, you know, a calm, quiet voice and just know that if your child really is in a, as Lauren was saying, kind of in a full blown um, meltdown, uh, you know, Moro state, um, you can give them a little bit of pressure if they'll allow you to do that. You may, don't try to reason with them. They're not in their rational brain. So give them time. Just, you know, you might even just talk, um, our, our voices can be very soothing to the nervous system. So, so you might just, you know, sort of hum or talk really uh, gently and quietly, kind of a low voice, you know, talk about anything. It doesn't matter what, um, read poems, you know, <laughs> uh, just, um, but that can be soothing, you know, if, if the child is really, um, you know, really in that hyper moro state. But in general, with with our kids, if we can start to help them notice that they're what it feels like when they're anxious, and you know, work with them on breathing, a little bit of pressure can help. I like the breathing. I think that is a big one. 
I work with a lot of families and parents just on different breathing techniques. So you think about the physiological symptoms that happen when um, this Moro is firing. So right. Moro. And and with that deep breathing, you know, we like to do the five count breath. You breathe in for five, breathe out for five, counting on your fingers. Um, and um, it just then floods the brain with oxygen. So it's going to be able to take care of itself better slows down, you know, that panic response. And and I know that kids, whether they consciously know it or not, they know that it's helpful because I see them use it on their own. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Oops, so Karen says, thank you. Um, he had bad allergies too. She forgot that allergies were a part of that more. They are. And mm -hmm. ear, nose and throat uh, symptoms as well. Because if you mm -hmm. think about that stress response is putting cortisol into the system and, and, you know, it's, it's in the neck, it's, you know, it's going through the lymphatic system. So ear, nose and throat, tonsil issues, things like that. Also mm -hmm. symptoms of Moro. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So Ronke, she has a follow-up question. So when they don't, what happens? I think she's referring to when um, reflexes don't integrate. Can um, it impact, can the impacts on learning be reversed? Yes. And mm -hmm. we are going to talk a little bit about after, you know, a little bit later in the show, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the um, techniques that we use to help integrate reflexes, but they can um, be integrated. So that, and, and, oh my gosh, we see such change as a result. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and, and behavior. I mean, I talked about Cami. Her, where her symptoms come out in behavior, I mean, it can make a dramatic difference with learning as well, um, or behaviors associated with learning, all of those different kind of functions at the top of the continuum. Absolutely. Absolutely. We're, we're working with a, um, a teenager right now who has traditionally had a little bit of difficulty with um, expressive language and definitely with attention. And uh, working with the retained reflexes I mean, her, her communication is getting so much better. And this is, you know, this is a kid in regular classes and everything, but, but still there are learning issues there that are getting in her way and uh, her ability to sustain her attention and, and just the connections for, for that expressive language. We've seen such change doing the reflex integration. I've even seen, I know you talk about, we talked about younger students a lot, but with older students, teenagers um, and skills at the executive function level change mm -hmm. uh, working passively on integrating reflexes. I'm sure you guys will get to that soon, but okay, we have one more question. Let's bring it up here. Cindy says she has not heard much about this, this topic. And um, she has a son who just turned 10. Is he too old at this point to get help? And how can I find clinicians in New Jersey? <laughs> Go ahead. I mean, I could, I could take it. <laughs> yeah. Um, it is not too late. We see kids, um, you know, 10, 11, 12 teenagers. We've worked with adults on retained reflexes and it has made a difference. So it is never too late um, to work on integrating retained reflexes. Um, and, and to answer your question, we don't have a physical center in New Jersey right now, but we are working with kids remotely. And so when we talk about some of our uh, therapies that we we use to integrate retained reflexes. We'll talk about that and we can do them remotely. We're right now we're working with a lot of students from all over the world, really um, remotely on, on all, all the learning skills on the continuum and core learning skills is definitely and retained reflexes is definitely included in that. Yep, absolutely. All right. So I love it. So many questions, <laughs> such a hot topic. Let's get back into it and uh, keep posting everyone and we'll check in later. All right. Thanks, Brianna. If you're just joining us, this is LD Expert Live. I'm Jill Stowell here today with Lauren Ma, the Director of Clinical Growth and Operations for Stowell Learning Centers. We've been talking about the connection between reflexes and behavior and learning. When students come to the, to the Learning Center for help with learning or attention challenges, the first step is to do a functional assessment to see what is really at the root of the problems that the parent is concerned about. In addition to reflex testing, 
we listen really carefully to what the parents are saying so that we can listen for symptoms that they're seeing that might indicate issues with primitive reflexes. We've mentioned some of those, uh, but here are a few more characteristics that you might see in school. Uh, easily distracted, difficulty paying attention to details, poor handwriting skills, speech disorders, spelling difficulties, difficulty with times tables and word problems in math, impulsivity and hyperactivity, poor memory, comprehension, and concentration, anxiety, dyslexia, dyscalculia, and auditory processing problems. There's just so much here we're going to give you a handout. We're going to share a handout with you um, with the educational implications of retained reflexes. And you can get this by going to stowellcenter.com slash reflexes. It's important to understand the connection between these lower brain functions and higher learning. Equally important is knowing that these reflexes can be integrated. So Lauren, let's talk about some of those interventions for integrating reflexes. So I referred to uh, a few of our, our programs. One of them is core learning skills. Uh, we, we call it CLS. Um, and what core learning skills is, is, is a program, is a system of movement exercises that integrate retain reflexes, but also build some of those early visual skills and fine motor skills, gross motor skills, because at that core learning skills level, all of those skills are related and connected. And so, and because the brain matures and develops, so a retained reflex is not going to look the same um, in a baby as it does in a 10 year old. It's going to look different. It's going to be very subtle. Um, and so we want to incorporate some higher level activities along with primitive reflex integration. Um, we're not generally just working on, on one reflex, it's a system. Um, reflexes are really connected and they support each other. There's a lot of reflexes that impact other reflexes and so you have to work with them together. Um, and with core learning skills, the, it, it's a, a system of movement patterns. So I talked about the ATNR with Abby, how she's head turns and her arm goes out like that. Well, some of our exercises that we have in core learning skills mirror that, that movement pattern. And so we're teaching kids and, and teens and adults to make those movements intentionally, to, to have that, that reaction go through the brain. So I can move my head and I can move my arm independently of each other. And the more you do that repetitive motion, the more that reflex gets stimulated and gets to integrate. That is how babies, when, when reflexes are supposed to integrate when babies um, are little, that's how the reflex integrates is that pattern keeps um, happening, that, that it keeps firing. And so that's what CLS looks like. It's a lot of like in, intentional, repetitive motions to integrate a retained reflex. Um, and this is a program that we can do remotely with, with students all over the world. Um, you know, we're, we're doing it through uh, remote one-on-one -on -one sessions. So we're co coaching the student through it and we, we move as quickly as they do. So we're looking for, you know, changes in every single session. And, but it is gonna be a lot of movement. So we have kids in front of their computers and their iPads and they're moving and clinicians moving and we're coaching them through that. The other program that we use to, uh, stimulate and integrate retain reflexes is QRI, it stands for quantum reflex integration. It uses light as stimulation to stimulate those reflex patterns. So instead of the individual moving consciously and, and making those patterns, we're actually stimulating those same neurological patterns in the body, but using a low level laser instead. Um, and this is more of a passive way to stimulate those reflex patterns. We often, we can combine it with core learning skills or we can use it by itself. Sometimes we um, we do QRI with students that might feel a little bit embarrassed in the beginning about moving, moving um, especially if they're on site in the center. Um, remotely, nobody cares, you know, but if they're, if they're in our center, we might, you know, with a teenager, start with QRI to start to stimulate those reflex patterns. That is something that right now, because it does involve specialized equipment, 
we can only do in the center unless the, the parent wants to purchase and then we can also coach um, that as well. That is that is what I used with Cami because she was so young. Um, she wasn't exactly ready for, for CLS um, because it, it involves a lot of intentional movement. Um, I used QRI with her and so she would sit and I would, I would run those reflex patterns and I would do extra on the reflexes that I saw that were retained when I tested her reflexes. And that's what made the difference and got her walking within four days. Um, just kind of like an anecdotal story about the impact that uh, reflex integration can have on a child's life. We had a family come to us in the middle of the lockdown in California here. You know, we, we shut down um, and you know, we all went to virtual learning. A lot of our kids are trying to do virtual learning. And we had a mom come, come to us that was absolutely desperate um, because her eight-year-old daughter was just, you know, running up the walls. I mean, she just could not focus. Um, you know, she was, she was kind of losing her mind over virtual learning, just having a really hard time not being in school. And so she came to us um, when, we, when it was safe to open back up again. We were able to test her reflexes. We found that she had a significant number of retained reflexes. And so we started um, QRI with her, just working on her reflexes. And she, I mean, she had a lot of diagnoses. She was on medication. I saw her, the, she's been with us, I think they started in April or May. So a couple of months, th that child is completely different. And the mom actually said to us probably two months ago, she is no longer my problem child. It, she's now focused on kind of her other, her other child, but like this girl went from being almost completely um, dysfunctional, not being able to do any kind of school to going into this school year and being able to sit in front of the computer and focus just because her system was now supporting her. And so I just, that's a, a remarkable story and I have a ton of them, but that's the one that comes to mind because a lot of times when you have core learning issues, and we're sitting now, we're not moving as much, we're sitting in front of computers, those things are gonna come up even more now with virtual learning. Absolutely, yeah. You know, I wanna give you uh, a reference. When you were talking, I was thinking, um, the developer of QRI wrote a book called Symphony of Reflexes, and, that, and that's by Bonnie Brandis. Um, that would be a good resource for parents if you're interested in just understanding reflexes better. And uh, they do actual, actually have some manual reflex integration tools in the back of that book. Mm -hmm. Another invaluable tool that we use to integrate or, or to increase regulation and support integration of reflexes and development of core learning skills is sound therapy. In October, we had Alex Doman, the founder of Advanced Brain Technologies and the developer of the listening program on the broadcast. So if you wanna dig into sound therapy a little bit more, watch that episode. The lower frequencies in sound below 750 Hertz are what we call body sounds. They're grounding and organizing. And we prescribe sound therapy with these lower frequencies for students who lack body control and who exhibit physical overflow. So these are often children who are hypersensitive, wiggly, clumsy, or uncoordinated, who experience disorientation when reading or writing, or those with attention and behavioral challenges. These students need settling and grounding. They need to develop a more secure sense of where they are in space in order to improve their self-control. Well, the auditory system is connected to uh, the attention system and regulation and the emotional system in the brain and then to all of the organs in the body except for the spleen. So it's that widely connected throughout the body. So we can use sound. And in this case, it's beautifully recorded music to actually um, help with that grounding and sense of security and, and settling. So sound therapy using lower frequencies like the Advanced Brain Technology Spectrum Program 
can have a rapid and profound effect on students with extreme anxiety, poor physical and emotional regulation, and reactive behaviors. So it definitely supports all of the work that we're doing there at that reflex integration and core learning level. Let's check back in with Brianna and our viewers one more time. And then before we wrap up, I'm going to give a special tip for parents whose kids are struggling with bedwetting because we talked about how that can be related to retained reflexes. Hello. We do have a few more questions here. So let's put up Kathy. Um, mm. Hi. Hi, Kathy. Hi, to Kathy. Says, too. <laughs> <laughs> her daughter started stole virtually, and it was a great decision for them. Um, she's seeing her communication skills are increasing, and so she says she enjoys her voice and her disagreement. She's finding mm. her oh. voice. <laughs> Thank you, Kathy. <laughs> Yeah. And then we have a, a question from Melissa. Hi, Melissa. She wants to know the time frame for seeing results with QRI. So it really depends on what the objective is, what we're going after. So with Cami, she was very young, um, you know, 18 months. And my, my sole objective was to integrate the reflexes that were getting in the way of walking. So that was a very short timeline because I was, I was going I was going for something very specific. When we have kids that come in and they're older because they have, you know, developed some coping strategies, they've developed kind of some some splinter skills on top of weak underlying skills, sometimes it it does take a a little bit longer. Um, and if we're going after, you know, ease with learning or if we're going after emotional regulation, Sometimes we have patterns that that students have been kind of programmed with responses to stress that have to kind of be undone. And so generally, you know, it's different for every student, but generally parents start seeing some kind of shift within a month or two. Um, and it depends on how often they're coming, um, you know, and how consistent they are. Um, you know, if they're consistent with sound therapy at home, that definitely speeds up the process. Um, and so there's there's factors that can get in the way, but usually parents start to see some kind of change within the first few months. But it is different for every child. And your clinician, if you're working with your clinician, the clinician will tell you things to look for. Because sometimes as parents, we get so busy with the day to day that we don't realize that our child has made a shift mm -hmm. uh, and that they're doing something differently. And they are. And so um, sometimes our clinicians have to point it out for parents to be like, you know what? we went to go read this page and instead of her getting stressed out or avoiding she read it and that's a huge change for her so um i hope that answers your question it is different but generally you know within the first few months you start to see some kind of shift awesome okay do we have time for one more you have a private message coming in okay um they ask are there things that parents of toddlers and young children um should they be doing to help integrate reflexes? You know, the as a for an infant, you just need to make sure that they have some tummy time. You know, they need to have time where they can move and and you know allow them to work at it. Don't don't automatically help them with everything. They need to use their bodies to start to. Uh, integrate the reflexes and understand what their bodies do. And so it's going to be a little bit of stress and strain as they try to start to roll over and things like that. With toddlers, get them outside, get them opportunities to climb and run and jump and, and just, again, move and explore their bodies. That is really, the, movement has such a profound impact on learning. And it's really hard these days because we have so many educational games and really cool things on iPads and screens. And, and we think, gosh, I've got to have my child do all these educational things so they'll be really ready for kindergarten. The best thing you can do is get your child moving, give them opportunities to use their bodies. And really for all of us, not I was going to say all students, but really all of us, you know, for our memory, our attention, our learning or our um, work, our emotional regulation, 
we need to have movement in every day. Mm -hmm. Yes, movement is key. All right, well, if your question, or keep posting your questions um, as we continue, if they don't get answered, if we don't have time, um, definitely we can answer it in Mom Squad. So ask to join if you're not a member and post in there and we will have somebody respond to you. Great, thank you, Brianna. This mm -hmm. is LD Expert Live. I'm your host, Jill Stowell, talking with Lauren Ma about integrating retained reflexes for improved functioning and learning. It looks like we have some more. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to wrap it up, but I'll wait. I know. I'll wait. I missed these ones. Okay, okay, here we go. <laughs> Sharon, she says, please clarify things to look for to know if ADHD symptoms alone are most present or if any uh, learning disabilities still persist. She has a son in 12th grade, testing at grade five. Um, indicated good working memory. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, do they need extra time? Do they need extra time? Is that what you said? Uh, but students yeah. need extra time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he didn't. He didn't test as having a le learning issues and academics. Um, good working he, memory. Right, but he needs extra time to complete tasks. I think that that's what it means. So, you know, she's wanting to know the difference between is it ADHD alone or a learning um, challenge um, and, and perhaps even retain reflexes. Um, so I and I say this to parents a lot. If something is pervasive and it is affecting one of those higher level skills, if it's affecting behavior, if it's affecting, you know, anything, any kind of functioning in school. Yeah, there might be something going on. We do know. I mean, ADHD is a learning challenge. It affects attention, but it can also impact learning at the higher level. Um, and and most often, uh, retained reflexes are a component of ADHD. We know that they're present in our kids that have a diagnosis of ADHD. So, you know, as a, a, a label isn't just a label. I think when Dr. Um, Lakata was on our show, he talked about you know a label helps to identify um, a group of symptoms, but the symptoms kind of all have a root. And so that's how we look at learning, not just a label. We look at, okay, can these symptoms be alleviated? And so if there's something pervasive that is getting in his way, absolutely, that can, that can be developed. And, she adds, and sorry, um, Brianna, I think you said um, this is a 12th grader who's testing at a fifth grade level. Is that what you said? No, sorry, here, I'll put, I'll put it up again. Her son is in grade 12, but grade five testing indicated good working memory. Oh, she wow. also adds his processing speed uh, score was low as well. So sometimes, um, sometimes students with good working memory, you know, with a good memory, they can compensate for a lot of things for a lot of time, for a long time. And, um, you know, if this student, if really, truly, if they just get a little bit of extra time on tests or a little bit of extra time on a project and they're able to do it well, you know, function well that way, that may be the only intervention they need. But chances are, if they're needing that extra time, there's, there is some kind of a root cause to it. We have a comment from Jane. Hi, Jane. Such great info. Wish more parents were aware of primitive reflexes. I know there's not a lot of info out there. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think that's it. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Brianna, and everybody who's been contributing. This is, you know, this is an important topic, and and you're right. Someone commented, you know, it's like you don't hear that much about it. And that's, that's true. Um, I uh, did some uh, training with a developmental pediatrician one time, and she was commenting, we were talking about these things. And she said, you know, we look at these reflexes to see how the baby is when they're born and to make sure they're developing properly. But she said, you know, it, it was never a consideration never a thing that they even thought about that if they didn't integrate, it could cause any problems down the road. They only look at them in infants. Mm -hmm. So 
uh, it's it is there's information out there for sure, but uh, it, it is not necessarily widely recognized, uh, talked about, noticed. So, um, all right, I told you I was going to give you um, give you a little tip here. Um, Earlier in the episode, I mentioned that bedwetting can be related to retain, a retained spinal reflex. There are certainly other reasons why a child might have problems with bedwetting, but if your child is struggling with bedwetting, try having him or her do snow angels two to three times a day. This exercise will help integrate the spinal gallant reflex, and it has been very successful in eliminating the bedwetting problem. And no, you don't have to have snow to do it. Uh, don't forget to download your handout on educational implications of retained reflexes by going to stowellcenter.com slash reflexes. Lauren, what very quick last thoughts do you have for our viewers today? Okay, first thing is that I call it mom's instinct. Parents' instinct is usually correct. So all kids go through phases that come and go, but if you see behaviors or issues that are pervasive over time, um, it's an indicator that something else might be going on. So like in Cammie's case, I saw an atypical response to stress, or I saw that her gross motor movements were delayed. Go with that instinct. If you're seeing the same kind of pattern as your child gets older, still you know, difficulty with the same types of skills, there's usually something there. Um, and the other thing, this is, this is a big deal, and, and mom's guilt is also a real thing. It's not your fault, and it's never too late. So do not blame yourself if your child has core learning issues or retain reflexes. You can't help genetics. You can't help how your kids came into this world. You can't, if you're a, an adopted parent, you can't help what happened to your children before you got them. Okay, so when Cammie was born, I had already been working for the Learning Center for 10 years, and I still had difficulty recognizing that she had retained reflexes. And I'd worked at that point worked with hundreds and hundreds of kids, um, and I, you know, had difficulty recognizing it in my own child. So, do not blame yourself if for the cause. Do not blame yourself if you don't catch it in time. This is not something that's talked about widely. Um, and so, you know, the time is now, the time to take action is now. And there, there are definitely things that you can do now to help your child. Absolutely. Thank you, Lauren, for sharing your expertise and for sharing your insights as a parent. Always, always brilliant. This is LD Expert Live, your place for answers and solutions for learning disabilities, dyslexia, and attention challenges. We're live every Tuesday at 10 a.m. Pacific. Next Tuesday, our guest, Dr. Regine Maradian, is going to talk about important issues facing parents today, including how to create boundaries around technology and video games. So, and many other things actually. So uh, be sure and join us to uh, talk with her at 10 a.m. next Tuesday. Stowell Learning Centers are open for remote sessions and screenings. We're also seeing students on site with all the COVID precautions. We work with children and adults doing targeted brain training to improve thinking and learning. If you would like a free consultation for yourself or your child, give us a call or visit our website at stowellcenter.com. Thank you, Lauren and Brianna. Thank you to all of you who have been sharing and subscribing and asking questions and joining us each week. We'll see you next week.